The Lead. Sponsored by Lavish Boutique, Lavish Coffee, Jasper Veterinary Clinic, Jasper Bone and Joint, and Carl Cannon Chevrolet Buick GMC. Uh, some folks don't realize how incredibly difficult it is to make that upper echelon. You've been there, you kind of know. I mean, those guys are really, really dynamic golfers, right? Yeah. I, I had people, you know, maybe I'll go out, you know, and maybe I'll shoot 69 or something like that. And, you know, and they see the guys on TV shoot 69. So, well, you can do that. When, like, literally, there's a handicap system for golf. And I'm like a plus one, which means I'm supposed to shoot one under par every round. That same handicap system applied to the pros. They're literally plus seven, plus eight. I'd have to get four shots aside, you know, per nine holes just to even have a fair. That mm -hmm. you know, so they just, it's incredible, uh, you know, how, how good they are. Yeah. And uh, a lot of it, I was... Uh, I hit the ball well enough to have done better, but those guys from 100 yards in, that's probably my weakness. Uh, and the putting, they make so many putts and chips, and, and so uh, it's impressive what they do. Speaking of those guys, is there somebody you've met across the years from the professional ranks that you were impressed by just in the meeting of them, have any interaction uh, as you've been in the golf world all these years? Um, the first one that comes to mind is, is really as I played as a senior amateur, Latrobe uh, Country Clubs in Pennsylvania. That's where Arnold Palmer's dad was the, was the pro and Arnold, Mr. Palmer, uh, grew up there playing. So he was bad sick. This, he, he, later, he passed away later this particular year. And so this U.S. senior group, all of them idolized Mr. Palmer. And so they had this tournament there and we we're going to get to see Arnold Palmer, and everybody was excited because he was going to come out and be a part of it because he knew a bunch of these guys. They were older than me, a lot of them, in, at the time. And um, so we were all excited about that. Well, they sent an email out probably a month and a half before we were supposed to be there. It's going, Arnold's not doing well. Doesn't look like he's going to be able to make the event. Well, he did make the event, and so he came out. It was the first round, and I shot 69, and it was the low round of the day at the time. And he literally, we're sitting there, and he's talking to the different people, and he's working away saying stuff. And he said, uh, he had asked, I guess, the score table, he says, who's Steve Hudson? He shot the 69. Because he came around, he says, he says, uh, you're Steve Hudson? I go, yes, sir. He said, boy, that was one fine round today. Mm. He, you know, he'd never shot over 69, probably. <laughs> in the, you know, so he, he made you feel like, like, mm -hmm. holy smoke, like he, he did something. But he was just that kind of person. Yeah. And then uh, he sat down, then another guy came up to our table and sitting down and he had a Royal Birkdale was a golf shirt and he played, obviously the British Open was there. And uh, he says, and he just said, hey, he said, did you get to play, you know, Royal Birkdale? And he said, he said, yes, sir. He said, how'd you like it? You know, it's just like, it's so nice. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then I, I was sitting there, I go, I said, Mr. Palmer, I said, you remember that time you were in that in that bush, there's a famous picture of him hitting a ball out of a bush at Royal Birkdale. You remember that time you were in that bush and he hit it out, out of the bush onto the grain? And he goes, I was in a lot of bushes. <laughs> 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 so he was just so charming. Yeah. So that, and my dad loved Arnold Palmer and my brother too. And, um, and so just getting to be around him a little bit. Dad, and I mentioned Tony Lee earlier, and dad, Tony Lee was a member of uh, Bay Hill, which was Arnold's play. Mm -hmm. And so Tony would take Dad down there and they would play in the member guest. And uh, so they got to spend a good bit of time with him yeah. and, and enjoyed that. Pretty amazing uh, to think about it, to be around football legend like Coach Bryant and then to get to meet Arnold Palmer that way. And so, so now in these years, you're involved with another famous Alabama coach, Coach Saban. Talk a little bit about your work with him. I think you you said to me when you sat down, you played golf with him yesterday. Yeah. So just yeah. Talk a little bit about your association yeah. with him and what you're doing. Yeah, he's playing a lot more golf. We're actually playing Sunday. <laughs> he's show, probably a little more relaxed, I guess. He is. He's, he looks good and just enjoying things. I did go with him to, uh, they just had the uh, Saban Legacy Award for the coaches. They did Bobby Bowden 
and uh, Coach Beamer mm -hmm. from Virginia Tech. And um, so that's something that the uh, Birmingham Quarterback Club started. This was the third year. And and so he, he he's excited about that, mainly because just he knows how hard it is to do the things that these coaches do to be successful. And so honoring these coaches, and he had ties with both of those coaches that they honored this mm -hmm. year uh, when, when he was in West Virginia. And so he, he loves that, but he really loves um, Nick's kids. And, um, and Miss Terry's really runs that. Coach is obviously a big part of it. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm fortunate I'm on their, uh, on their board so I get to spend some time seeing what they're doing, which is mm -hmm. incredible. They're, they're actually building a Saban Center. And it's going to be a mecca for kids from all over the state of Alabama and Mississippi and wherever else where they'll come. And they'll have a STEM program where they can really help kids and assess what their strengths are and, and uh, give them encouragement. But it's, it's just going to be a wonderful place for kids to come and be nurtured, encouraged, and and so that's real important to him now. Sure. Obviously, he's got the Mercedes dealership. He got a Ferrari dealership. Um, so he wants he wants those to be as best they can. Not just from a financial perspective. He just he wants things to be as good as they can be. It doesn't matter. So um, so normally when we play golf and we'll play with like Patrick Drummond and John Lyon and Tab, we we go on a trip with them and he likes playing. We'll play a fivesome and. He and I'll play the combination of the other three, and he's competitive. He doesn't like to lose, <laughs> but he likes to. The people don't realize is that he um, he really likes teasing and picking. You know, while they're playing, some people call it the mouth wedge, but uh, <laughs> right. that's kind of what it is. And so they're they're always going back and forth, but it's it's always a lot of fun. But I remember so one of the trips um, we go to Kiba Dunes. Now we used to go to Panama City, and so. Uh, this was early on in him being in Alabama, and it may have been the second trip or third trip that we took. I was his partner, and I, I missed the green on the first hole, just barely, you know. The second hole, I had a good drive and got out there, and second shot, and I missed the green today, and I got back in the cart with him, and he goes, Steve, are you even going to try today? You know? <laughs> <laughs> We're just out there having fun, you know, and he's going like, come on, you can do better than that. Right. So I learned, you know, growing up, Obviously, with Dad as a as a coach, and he was a wonderful coach and instructor. Gave, you know, um, he expected us to do you know do good. Yeah. So we had that high standard. And I think when I, I we talked a little bit about the high school stuff, but I look back, and one of the things was, um, you know, he Dad wants to do best on every single thing that we did. Yeah, sure. That's just kind of what he expected, and so that gets in. That becomes part of who you are. So no matter what it is that you do, so, um, so, so, but but back to coach. A lot like dad. I mean, there's you know not the, not the success level, but um, he just he has a way of having you focus. And one of the things that helped me when I first started playing, especially the senior golf, when he came, you know, he said. You can't look at the scoreboard. And I was bad about, he says, you can't look at the scoreboard and you can't worry about what you did. Mm -hmm. I'd be worried about the three putt I had four holes ago and I'm mm -hmm. still, you know, like, he said, well, you, you know, that you're just attracting another three putt. You know, mm -hmm. he says, if you give it energy, it's going to come towards you. And so it helped me a lot. And Miss Terry, she does a lot of stuff that he does. You know, she's, I remember talking to her one time, I'd call him and tell him I was doing in the tournament, whatever. And she said, well, be where your feet are, you know, and that's something that he used a lot. Just be present and do the very best you can right here. And so it actually helped my golf game and helped me to improve. And a lot of it was I was kind of present. Oh, oh you start playing good, then you get ahead of yourself. That's why he's talking about don't look at the scoreboard. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're six under par, all of a sudden, you know, you're not used to being six under par, and on the first two you are like, ooh, if I par in, I shoot mm -hmm. 66, you know. And, What's the reporter going to ask you? Know, you know, that's sure. way ahead of yourself. But that helped to not get ahead of myself. But the big thing that helped me was let go of what's behind you. Mm -hmm. You can't change it. So you've, you've literally been with him to see that he practices what he preaches, right? That oh, that's yeah. his life. Oh, it's yeah. not just something he's mouthing off, but that's, that's how he lives. Yeah. 
and he you know he does a lot of talks, speeches, and that thing. So people that never even met him before, but you know, see him on the stage, and it's they. A lot of businesses just love and eat up what, how he thinks, and they see that because it's just you know about being the best you can be. Sure. Well, uh, one of the things that's best about our area is the Walker Area Community Foundation, and I know you're a part of that as well. Talk a little bit about that. Yeah, that's, you know, it's incredible. It's, you know, they've been doing it for years. I don't know exactly what year it started. John Oliver was real involved. Eddie Jackson, been way involved. Best Stukes, Abby Drummond, Gary Drummond. Um, just a lot of, a lot of people. Um, and... Yeah, Larry and John were really, Larry Drummond was really involved, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, but it's incredible what they're doing and continuing to try to do uh, for the for the area. Mm -hmm. And it's just, at some point, you know, you, you, you're you blessed and you appreciate that and you even pray for blessings, you know. But at some point, you played a you and Coach, this is what Coach, he even says this. He says, are you praying for a blessing, are you praying to be a blessing? Mm -hmm. And so at some point in your life, earlier you get this, the better, uh, to be a blessing and do things for others. Mm -hmm. And so I work with people that have had a lot of financial success. Not all of them are the happiest people in the world just because they got a lot of money. The joy you realize as you get older, the things that are important, you know, doing things for others. Sure. And being a blessing for folks. Sure. So the Walker Area Community Foundation is just, it's incredible what they're doing. I'd encourage people to, you know, get involved. Of course, they raise money and they have donor advised funds you can do. And then you can alloc allocate where you want that money to go. And so there's a lot of work that goes into it. And because they have grant review people in the community that go and meet with these people and make sure that, you know, they're using the money in the, in the best possible way. And then they give them guidance. If they don't qualify this year, then hey, you need to do this, do better at this, and and give them coach. So, it's it's impacting the community now, but it's unbelievable how much it's more it's going to impact. And so that's a little bit like you said. I appreciate you asking the question because, um, you know, like the Saban Center and kind of the things that they've done with Nick's kids, I see it there. You know, behind the scenes, and then with the Walker Community Foundation. Um, and it's just, it just wants you to be involved and do more, more for others. Well, it kind of goes back, I, I guess, maybe to something uh, referencing your dad then, so we'll circle all the way back around. I'm sure that one of his uh, adages to you guys was leave things better than you found them, right? And so that's part of what this is, Coach Saban, the Walker Area Community Foundation. So uh, let's just say that you're giving advice um, to parents maybe who have a, a, a daughter or a son who has an interest in golf at a young age. So what would you say to them, giving back to the community now that gave you your start, so this is your opportunity to kind of give back some advice to say, okay, if I have a son or daughter that has an interest, here's what I would say. Yeah. Um, I think the, the first thing, looking back at, you know, my experience is that we were taught a work ethic. Mm -hmm. And so if, if you don't have a work ethic, it, it almost doesn't, you can't buy a golf game. Right. We tried to, you know, <laughs> right. $400 on a driver, you know. <laughs> sure. So you've, you've got to have a work ethic and you need to learn that early. Mm -hmm. So well, I think the greatest thing you can give a child is a work ethic. Mm -hmm. So whatever that is, now we used to. I used to pick up range balls, and I honestly think by hand, I I started to say I'm I'm the number one ball picker up of, by hand. Now the machines, you know, if we didn't have the machines, we ended up with a tube. Mm -hmm. Used to bend over. Burton Bag Manufacturing was in town, so Burton Bag would give Dad all these, the cover that goes over the bag to protect the clubs or whatever. We had a bunch of those, so I'm bending down, getting the ball, getting the ball. Tab did some, but I picked up unbelievable amount of golf balls by hand. So maybe I'm in the top 10. So. <laughs> right. But, you know, that and then, you know, go raking bunkers, you know, and mm -hmm. you had to do it. And that was like Coach Saban talks about if he didn't wash the car right for his dad, you know, because they had the gas station, they'd wash the car for people. He would come out and just spray water on it and say, do it again. Well, 
raking a bunker. You know, dad's going, there's a way to, you don't just go in and rake a bunker. You actually had to go both ways with the rake. And, it, and the important part, the last stroke was away from you because you didn't, if you pushed it away from you, it would smooth out the grooves of the rake handle. So, you know, that, that eye to detail. Mm -hmm. And he would check it out too. Mm -hmm. it sure. Held you accountable. So I, nowadays, and I don't know, I think even growing up on a farm, we didn't grow up on a farm. I mean, we had 35 head of cattle after we got up. And, but dad grew up with the cattle. He thought everybody should have some. So there was some work involved in that. We would dehorn them and deworm them and run them up in the corral and lock them down on the deal. So men the fence that was we'd get calls in the middle of the night that we knew what it was two o'clock in the morning you know going like travis your cows are out so we go <laughs> we jump in the truck and go go put them back up and uh the other thing like we watered the golf course uh at musgrove in the summer and we only had enough the pump was only big enough i think it's what it was to only do nine holes at a time mm -hmm. but we only had enough sprinkler heads to do nine holes at a time but i think it's we couldn't do all 18 hoes, it wouldn't push. So we literally would put them in, you know, 7.30, 8 o'clock at night, you know, after everybody's mm -hmm. kind of off the golf course, we'd put them in, go back out at 11 o'clock and take up every one of those sprinklers and go to the other nine hoes and lock them in to the other nine hoes. So I say that I didn't, I didn't know there was a choice. I mean, sure. people go like, my goodness, you guys did a lot of stuff. It's have like, I, 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 I just, like that was his life, his choice. It? Yeah, it was just like here we go, you know. So and I love, you know, you just loved hanging out with your dad and work. I wish young people could work or go to work and work with their parents, and they'd really appreciate more what they do. Yeah, you know, take a take a child to work day, that's okay. But I just wish. I mean, we were in the trenches with dad. Yeah, at, at Musgrove, and so I think that was a big benefit. So I don't know how you recreate that in today's world when, because uh, I, I was going to have a dollar. Um, bag groceries at Piggly Wiggly right there at Liberty Park and I said something to my wife about it and she's going like she's not going to bag groceries and I'm going like well <laughs> <laughs> so um, that work ethic uh, you got to figure it out and it needs to be early and so I don't know if it's you know where there's chores at home making bed mom mom expected us to make her bed up now I wasn't very good at it but at least you know we throw it back up over the pillow sure. uh, I just think that's critical for people yeah so then if you have that foundation then all of a sudden if somebody wants to learn to play golf have them uh participate in initially you know you really if you want to encourage to do it you know you, if you require them to do enough stuff to be able to do it then they just well i won't do that i won't play golf so you want to you got to encourage them enough at least when they play golf but when they do that if they want a new putter you know they need to pay for half of it somehow even if you pay them to make the bed and so i just can't say enough about that work ethic of the pays an unbelievable amount of dividends. So I go back to like high school, that what dad did and how we learned how to work. And I would, Coach Morrison, I'd love to ask him. Um, uh, Coach Miller at Farmstead, Coach Morrison, and I asked Coach Morrison because he was a football coach and basketball coach. Mm -hmm. But I, I honestly feel like I played every play in practice. I didn't do spring and I didn't do summer, but it was like the last play I was ever going to get to play in my life. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so sometimes, you know, we weren't supposed to be going as hard. I remember the quarterback had a little yellow or red jersey. I think it was a yellow little jersey they'd put over mm -hmm. the thing, whatever. And um, and he came around the corner. Uh, one of the other the offensive guys wasn't supposed to hit me, so I was intercepting the pass, and he just he wiped me out, you know. Is it, you know so... A couple plays later, our quarterback came around the corner, and I just, I just laid him out. <laughs> and he had that yellow jacket. And Coach Campbell's going, like, "What are you doing?" But I say that because that, that early childhood was a big part of me being as competitive. Mm -hmm. A lot of people are competitive, but you know, I was just doing the best I could on every play. Sure. Yeah. Well, what you're what you're illustrating is things that are taught and ingrained at a young age stay with us for life, right? Yeah. Because you, as you sit here today, you're reliving that, but that's who you are, you know, in your business life and your associations with others. And probably one of the things that uh, helps to connect you to Coach Saban, right? Because you have that same kind of mentality, you grew up that way. Yeah, and um, you know, so now more, I would, is initially how I 
we went through quite a few coaches there at Alabama for a while. Sure. And Mal Moore, he was like a you know second dad to me and Tab, and Tab probably more friends. And but um, the first thing when the when the coaches would come in, you know, they'd come in and they'd do spring, right? It's kind of when you get the new coach. And so the one thing that they needed to do is that we, the Bruno's has the big senior golf tournament, whatever. So some of them didn't know. I didn't do it with DuBose. But after that, I did, I've done it with every one of them. And Mike Price, we only did it once, but so he wasn't here that long. Right. But, um, so, but, but Mike Sheila, Coach Sheila, so, and Franchoni. So Mal Moore, he would ask, he, he would say, okay, go work with them and hit some balls and talk to them about what this is going to be like, because they haven't done it. You know, mm -hmm. there's a big crowd and everything. You know, so Mal Moore would pick me to do that. So I got to know all the coaches kind of early, and then we would always take a trip. Uh, with them and and so and I try to help them you know with their golf game and so that same thing happened with uh, you know Coach Saban and we, we hit it all and uh, Cedric Burns mm -hmm. who you know mm -hmm. um, wonderful guy's been there since he was I think 16 years old Coach Bryant hired him and a uh, real quick story there so I thought when Coach Saban came uh, I talked I talked to Cedric a couple of days later. And I says, What do you think, Cedric? And he said, Coach Bryant's back in the building. <laughs> he said, Everybody's scared. How about that? <laughs> yeah, scared to death. And so uh even you know, Cedric, he recognizes who's gonna get something done and who's not just because he's seen it. Sure. And uh he's he's been such a he's an institution himself, Absolutely. you know, as far as the University of Alabama. And so um so you know, you know got, got to know him that way and, and mostly through golf. Sure. Well, let's end on this. Um, you've played a lot of golf courses uh, around the world. Is there one that if you, as you're thinking about it right now, that is the course that you'd just love to play again, um, wherever it may happen to be? Right. Is there one in particular? Well, first off, that's a one, that is a great question. Normally when somebody asks that, they say, what's your favorite course? And that's impossible, you know, no. But uh, yours is an easy answer, and I say Pebble Beach. And partly because it's gorgeous. You know, if you watched golf on TV when you were younger, and they would, that was the first thing you saw about golf was the Pebble Beach tournament. Mm -hmm. You know, the weather was so nice, and they played nice music, and it's so beautiful. But my brother and I, and Philip went with us uh, one year. But Tab and I played in the World Two Men Team Championship out there. And so we played a, so we probably did it four or five years. And so that's four rounds, but we would play a couple other courses too. Mm -hmm. but, but we played it a lot and under competition. I think we finished second two times. You know, we, we should have, uh, definitely should have won it one year. Um, but just the memories there and it being so pretty and just gorgeous. So if I, if I had one round, last round to play, uh, I would say Pebble Beach. Pebble Beach. Yeah. yeah. Well, Steve, man, it's it, what a what a wonderful life you uh, are living. You've had privilege, you know, from, I, I guess you think growing up in Farmstead, cutting, you know, picking up range balls and cutting grass and watering the greens and all that. Could you ever have imagined your life now yeah. and the places you've been, the people you've met, you know, from Ar Arnold Palmer to Coach Bryant to Coach Saban and just the whole range of, I mean, it's pretty incredible, right? An incredible life. It is. I've been very blessed. Yeah. Well, it's just been wonderful. Oh, yeah. Uh, I, I'm going to forget, Ryan. We need you to sign the poster behind, Steve, okay. if you will. Please, sir, wherever you'd like. All right. And uh, some people go ahead and add a tag to it of a roll tide or whatever you want to do. But we're sure glad you're with us today. There we go. That'll work. All right. Well, Steve, thank you so much. Um, and I had the good pleasure of knowing your dad, uh, you know, in the latter years when I came to town and started as a coach and graduated from Curry back in 1982. So his, his um, um, fame lived on there. Of course, the field's named after him, you yeah. know, yeah. there the football field is. Uh, so good to be with you today and glad you could uh, share with us and 
There's more stories to tell, so we may have a round two somewhere along the way. I got to say one more thing. Yeah, sure. All right, because I do have two sisters, and they always get left out because <laughs> yeah. we're always talking about the sports stuff. But they've always been supportive. But my mom never missed a basketball game or a football game when I'm from the sixth grade through uh, through high school. How about that? So that's one of the nice things of maybe the older days when maybe the moms were at home and being able to be more more involved in those activities. But that they were wonderful and supportive in sure. life. So it was a whole family thing, yeah, yeah. not just the not just the boys. Yeah, yeah. The the ladies are a big part of it too. Yes, sir. Well, it's been our pleasure today and honor to uh, talk to Steve Hudson, and um, we hope that uh, you will watch this. But we also hope you will read Seventy Eight Magazine as well. It's uh, always free. Comes out every two months. You can pick those up around town at different places. So uh, my honor today again to have Steve Hudson with us here on The Lead. And so this is Greg Tinker saying good afternoon. The Lead, sponsored by Lavish Boutique, Lavish Coffee, Jasper Veterinary Clinic, Jasper Bone & Joint, and Carl Cannon Chevrolet Buick GMC.